I love museums. I go to museums all the time. Love art. Me too. I'm recently single, so. Me too. <laughs> awesome. Okay. I love it. I believe that each and every one of us has the power within ourselves to create the life that we really want. And I want to help give you the tools to make that happen. I'm Danica Patrick, and I'm pretty intense. On the show today is Chef Aaron Sanchez. Chef and I go back quite a ways. Uh, so he's such a nice guy, such a high vibe guy, totally blazed the trail from his mother onto him in the world of Mexican Creole cooking. Um, he has a memoir called Where I Came From. If anyone is interested in reading more in depth about his childhood and, and him becoming a chef, he comes from three generations of women who've wrote cookbooks. His mom has been a huge inspiration for him. He, we talked about, you know, addiction and, and his father and, um, you know, relationships and just all of the things that have taught us lessons over the years and what those lessons have done to create a man who knows how to balance life better uh, now than he ever used to. So please enjoy today's episode with Chef Aaron. How are you? Oh, look at you. You've got the wine. You bet Aww. you're, you bet you're Skippy. I'm all Aww. about it. You're the sweet. Oh my God. That's so awesome. Where did you, I mean, where did you get it from? I, I can't tell you from one of your distributors here in okay. New Orleans. And they sent oh, it to God, me yeah. to make sure that I'm able to support you and we can talk a little oh. bit of wine. And so oh. I'm excited about that. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Well, that was actually, that was the last time we saw each other was in yeah. New Orleans. Yeah. 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 That yeah. was a lot of fun. We need to get a, a proper hang next time. Okay. We'll go out to have dinner. Okay. Oh, I, yes, absolutely. You're not cooking mm. and neither am I. We're going to let someone else do it for us. All about it. Absolutely. Yeah. I would love that. You look great. I'm so happy. Are you having a decent summer uh, with oh. all the things you said? No, it's absolutely horrible. It's 2020. Look at you just killing it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, you sent it to me. So, I mean, it's important for me to, you know, kind of understand the juice. Oh, man. You're yeah. so sweet. You're so sweet. Do you love, I mean, do you love wine? I don't even know. I do. Yeah. You know, it's funny when I was a kid, when I was a kid, like my mom would always like give us a little taste and just say, you know, start to embrace wine because you don't want to have a fantastic meal with iced tea. You know what I'm saying? And right. it's like they work together. So she kind of always instilled that in me and my, and my twin brother very early on. And yeah. um, I mean, so I know now, your mom is a huge chef. So yes. the fact that she introduced you to wine as well kind of makes her a superhero. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I and mean, also there's something yeah. to like starting drinking wine really young and it not being some overwhelming big cool thing where, you know, you just kind of like little dabs here and there. Tell me more absolutely. about your mom. Yeah, my mom is just, you know, that's why I think I relate so much and I admire you so much. It's because I'm just used to having strong women in my life, whether it was my grandmother, my mom, um, and then my sister who also worked with me in the restaurants for many years. So my mom basically was a social worker and um, a caterer in El Paso, Texas, where I was born. And then early on, she grew up in a, in a Mexican cattle ranch in northern Mexico and, um, you know, was sort of cultivated and, and, and started to flourish there and then moved to El Paso, met my dad. Um, and then my mom, my dad didn't have a good run necessarily, but she always wanted to have her name in lights. And she says, I'm going to have my name in lights. So she went uh, to New York City to chase her dream of being a chef and a restaurateur. Did she get her name in lights? She did. Yeah? She did, yeah. How, how did that, how? Well, she went initially to New Orleans, where I'm at now, and I call my home. And she met Paul Prudhomme, the, the great uh, sort of iconic American regional chef from Louisiana. And they struck up a friendship. They became dear friends. And then Chef Paul said, what are you doing, Sarela? My mom's name is Zarela. She, she said, well, I'm divorced. I got twin boys. And I'm looking to start this career journey. And he made a call uh, to Warner Leroy, who owned Tavern on the Green in New York City. And then my mom came in the early 80s and started cooking Mexican food. And at that time, people didn't, they were just flabbergasted. They never tasted those flavors. 
Interesting. And that's how her, her name started to go out there and, and be known. And she would invite food critics and writers and all like the movers and shakers of New York at the time. And that's how she started to become known. And then when she opened up her own restaurant in 1987, it just took off from there. That blows my mind to think yeah. that people were only being introduced as sort of, would it be like Mexican Creole flavor? I mean, what was her, yeah. what was her, what was her, like, how did she cook? Yeah. What was her flavor profile? It was just very traditional stuff that my grandmother and they cooked at the ranch. It was straight Mexican food. But, you know, you have to, you know, remember at that time, people's interpretation or perception of Mexican food was gloppy orange cheese and all that stuff. You know what I mean? So I didn't have the sort of nuances and the delicate techniques and flavors that really Mexican food is now. So my mom was an absolute trailblazer, just like you in your Aww. field. Absolute trailblazer. So, you know. <laughs> that's, that's, that's amazing to me to think that only a few decades ago, people were only being introduced to high quality, fine, ref refined Mexican cuisine. Yeah. And, and, and what was harder for us was to procure the ingredients. I remember being a child and having to like come back from trips to Mexico in the summer and bring back bales of chilies. We were like chili mules. It was awesome. <laughs> We'd bring spices and all this stuff because we couldn't find it here in the States. And now everything is obtainable and it's, it's just, it's it show, goes to show you how 30 years changes things. Are there still a few things that you get from Mexico that you can't get here? Mm. Like a few little. Yeah. There's like some of, the, some of the more obscure, the obscure chilies, they make these really beautiful tamarind little candies that are dusted with chili that are like super addictive. And you're just like these little tart little candies. Um, yeah, there's tons of stuff, but you know, heirloom corn varieties that you can't get. Ah. So I, I'm like, when I go to, Me I'm going to Mexico on Thursday, um, cause I'm, um, you know, in the process of launching a tequila line. So I'm going to go out there and, and taste, uh, some tequilas and, and kind of figure out what, what I want to do, you know? So I'll Tell bring back some snacks. Tequila. I mean, I love wine. Yes. That's yeah. my, I mean, like. I was out on a boat all weekend and I just, and I tried to drink wine. It's a little tough. So my, like I do, but I do. So the other things that I would drink would pretty much only be tequila or vodka and club soda. Mm. So mm. Um, I want to know more about this tequila. Yeah. Well, tequila is one of the, it's, it's a spirit that is emblematic of Mexican culture. Yeah. Uh, Jalisco where Guadalajara is, which is the capital of Jalisco is some people consider the most Mexican of States because hmm. that's where mariachi music is from. They have very, a lot of iconic food dishes like birria and enchiladas and, and tortas ahogadas and all these really kind of very iconic dishes. And then if you go about an hour outside of Guadalajara, you find, Los Altos and, and, and tequila, where they produce all the tequila. And it's like, think of it as a Napa, you know, where you would go and just mm. see, instead of, you know, vineyards, you just see cactus and agave on each side. You know what I mean? Wow. And um, so it's, you know, everyone uh, is very, you know, astute about, you know, trying to make a tequila, but there's a lot of crappy tequila, just like there's a lot of crappy wine. Sure. But tequila in the last five years has exploded 300% as far as sales and people wanting it. So, um, you know, I've always been a fan and, I've, I've, you know, it's something that connects me to my culture. So I thought yeah. this would be a good time to do it. So what um, what makes one tequila better or worse than another? Like I could yeah. name ways in the wine business where, you yeah. know, things could, you know, adjust the flavor. But I don't know anything about tequila like that. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of it has to do with the quality of the agave. There's many different uh, styles of cactus or agave that you can distill the product from, just like grapes. Um, and then, yes, there's a certain degree when, you, when you're talking about aging. You know, the three styles that are most prominent are uh, plata or silver, blanco, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, reposado, which means mm -hmm. rested, and then añejo, oh. which means aged. So, oh. um, yeah, so it takes about nine years, you know, seven to nine years to actually mature the agave to make the juice. Right. Um, but it just really depends on what you want to have to go, what, what the flavor profile you want. Like for me, I like herbal notes. 
I like minerality. I mm-hmm. like, I don't, you know, I don't like it too sweet, but you know, American palates tend to like sweetness. So mm-hmm. this is the, the process. This is the, 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 the point of this trip this week to figure out that flavor profile that we want. So what, um, so where does that fall in for you? Is that a silver or is that? Yeah, we're going we're gonna, to, yeah, we're going to launch a silver and a reposado. We're not going to mess with Añejos just yet because those are I just like, better sellers. I think I like reposado the best. That's my yeah. favorite. It tastes sort of the most, I don't know, it tastes the most, um, it has flavor without being. Um, Abrasive. Yeah, and, and exactly. Hot. You know, you can tell a crappy tequila when it's hot. You know, when you taste it, it's pure alcohol and it burns. That means it's a shitty tequila, you know. But if it has those nuances on the front palate, mm-hmm. you know, what I was talking about, you know, the herbaceousness, a little bit of citrus notes, a little minerality, then you're dealing with something different. So, so it's just like wine, you know. You have to have a good yeah. producer. What about mezcal? Is that a whole, is that just like an added flavor? Is that a whole different agave plant or? Yeah, well, there's different agaves, but the biggest difference is, first of all, mezcal, all tequila is mezcal, but not all mezcal is tequila. You understand? It's, so it, it's a precursor to tequila. They've been, making, they've been making mezcal indigenous people in Mexico for 2,000 years. So it actually predates tequila by a lot. Wow. So in the biggest difference between mezcal and tequila is that the, the piña, right? So you have the cactus. They take the root of that, which is called the piña because it looks like a pineapple. Okay. And then they roast that. It's fire roasted. And they'll literally take like a donkey that will ro- ro- go in circles with like a big <laughs> a stone crusher. And it just crushes the, 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 the agave and makes it sap in this, in this beautiful juice. And that's how you make mezcal. And the old school way. Now they, they, now they modernized okay. it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't still do that. But I mean, okay. you know, but that's the romantic side cool. of it. But that's the old way that they used to do it. They used to have, a, did you say a donkey? Yeah, with, a, with like connected to a steel, I mean, a, 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 like a stone wheel mm-hmm. that would crush. You know, it's kind of like with wine when people used to step on grapes, right? You know, wow. back in the day. Yeah, you know I mean? yeah. Okay, so, so mezcal is just the the, sm- the roasting or smoking of the of the pineapple. The root, yeah, the root of the of the root. cactus. And so, if you were gonna only make, if you weren't gonna make mezcal, you just wouldn't roast it. Yeah, basically. And then you would you could either put it in stainless steel, like you would do, like a Chablis, right? A yeah. Chardonnay, you know, yeah. if you want to do that with no oak. And then, you know, Reposado would, would touch oak, you know, like a Blanco, you wouldn't put in oak. Oh, so tequila does go in oh, barrels, barrels absolutely. Like yeah. wine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, How long does it age for? Well, it depends, you know. I mean, sometimes it's, it's, it's you know, you got one to three years for a Repo, sometimes like three to five for an Añejo. It kind of really depends. Yeah, but there's a new style that's very interesting that's called a Cristalino that uh, is being brought to the market, which is actually Añejo that's clear. So what they do is they, there's a filtration system with, with carbon that takes out all the color of, of the Añejo and, and renders, it, renders it clear. Hmm. So you have the same flavor profile of Añejo, but it's completely clear. Just is aesthetic, so it's it's aesthetics, aesthetic. and it also doesn't like intimidate people. You know, it's when they think it's gonna be oh añejo, it's like drinking a cognac or an old scotch. You like it's gonna be some big thing in your mouth. So mm-hmm. it's kind of like a little bit of a perception thing as well. Mm. So tell me about wine. I want to know why you got into wine because you know what? Here we are. First of all, I got to give you some love. <laughs> all your beautiful wines because I'm all about promoting my friends, Aww. making sure they have everything that they need. <laughs> So this, oh, is your, this is your 2016, which was uh, with your distributors here in town so graciously sent me. And it's so, uh, so, Somnium. How do you pro- Somnium. I love that. So Somnium. Yeah, it means dream Somnium. in Latin. That's our new label. So we've, we've just launched. So it started with the Cabernet and then we made the Rosé. Um, yep. So mm. we make that what's called Sonia style. So we bleed off. Um, from the Cabernet to make the rosé. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And then, and then after that, we came out with the Sav Blanc this year, and now we just launched the um, we just lost, launched what I'm calling the Red Label, which is the more accessible price point that we actually we use a lot of estate wine in it, um, mm -hmm. but we buy a little bit of blending grapes to sort of like round it off and make it um, a little more ready to drink right now. Uh, gotcha. So <clears throat> yeah, so we add some Merlot and um, really just kind of make this wonderful. Wonderful, much, much, much more accessible price point wine. So, you know, it's all about that portfolio, right? Yeah, totally. No, yeah, I just I think mean, it's, I love wine just yeah. because, like, you love tequila. Like, I, I yeah. mean, you just kind of fall in love with it. But I think that, you know, there's such a romantic process to making it. Have you been wine tasting much? Yes, absolutely. My, my sister, my older sister, is the estate manager of a vineyard in Napa called Hudson. Oh, and, and Hudson. And by the way, if you guys want to buy some grapes down the road, I'm just going to have to plug my sister's, you know, sure. vineyard and where she works at called Hudson. And for many years, they have been selling grapes to all the big houses in Napa and Sonoma. Mm -hmm. um, um, the gentleman who's the owner's name, Lee Hudson, awesome dude, this iconic kind of winemaker in, in Napa. And so, yeah, so I, I've, I've loved wine. I've tasted a lot. I've gone through and done all the tours. I've been to Spain. I've been to France to taste. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm really into it. For me, I was so struck by the um, just how much labor goes into each vintage, and yeah. how every vintage is rare. You're never going to have another one, and so um, hence the reason why you never want to waste a bottle oh. because you're not going to make it again. Um, mm -hmm. Totally. <laughs> um, but but I, I just think that for me, it's the 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 farming of it and the love that goes into it. That's so amazing. And just how much time it takes. I don't think anyone understands just how many steps and levels there are and how much like hands-on care there is. So that's kind of, you know, and then, you know, of course, anything that, anything that joins people together in the, in the spirit of connecting and sharing, and you might not even be talking about the wine. Um, you might be talking about the food, uh, or you might just be talking about a bunch of random crap because you're with your friends. Like anything mm. that brings people together in this day and age, especially and away from technology and connecting people, I think is such a great thing, which is, you know, the point for me of making the wine and, and keeping that Slowing going. Slowing down. Yeah. Slowing down and creating conversation. Oh, 100%. You know, I agree. I mean, and it's so volatile. Grapes are so, they're on a timetable. Look at right now. My sister is so busy because it's harvest right now. It's only the beginning of September because of the heat. Yeah. So every year totally changes and you have to be on your toes and ready to adapt and overcome. Yeah. I love that yeah. about wine. I just think it's so fun. It's organic. It's living. I think, and it's the perfect pairing to fantastic food. And that's why I love it. You know, mm. so. What, you're, what? What goes best with um, Mexican cuisine? What do you think? Like, what is there? Because obviously, like, I mean, like, I've sat down to dinner before and anything that's really spicy, it's tough to pair, like, yeah. especially a red wine with. So help me out. What would I, what would I pair with? What would I pair with a Mexican? Oh, yeah. A I'm blend. Just tasting it. A blend like this is delicious because... Oh. You think about the blending of chilies, right? So it's very mm -hmm. typical. Like if I make a mole, which would have a mixture of mm -hmm. maybe three to five different chilies. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of the chilies like grapes. So a blend like yours right here mm -hmm. would be ideal for it because it can stand up to the heat. You know what I'm saying? You don't mm -hmm. want something that's very flabby. You don't want a gamay. You don't want a very light pinot. You don't want, you don't, you don't want even a grenache necessarily because I think the, the food would dominate the wine. So you want mm. something that stands up to it like this and mm. complements it perfectly. So mm. something like this beautiful cab blend that you have that you do, that's here that I'm tasting would be ideal for like a mole or enchiladas or something with a red chili based sauce. Yeah. Uh, and then you mentioned you guys are going to launch a Sauv Blanc, right? We did. Yeah. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Like for a Sauv Blanc for me, um, you know, like ceviche, something with, Citrus and chili mm -hmm. and herbs would mm -hmm. always be ideal with Sauv Blanc. Oysters mm -hmm. is probably the most, you know, common thing that you would think of, you know. So, you know, and I think that's why your wines pair so go so well with like Emerald's food, because Emerald has a lot of a lot of seafood in his in his in his style and in his in his menus. So I think that would really work well as as well. So I was actually talking to my friend 
this weekend and she was talking about how kids are, you know, not dating as much even like, I mean, there's, mm-hmm. we're talking about young kids, but I'm wondering just as like an example of um, what's going on that they're not really dating as much, but they're super friendly. Like they're FaceTiming all the time. They're doing social mm-hmm. media. Like they, they, they're, they've got tons of friends, but like the more intimate connections are maybe fading. Like I agree. How, what's, how do you, what, how do we remedy this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because, you know, I have a lot of, you know, millennials and young people that work with me at, at the mm-hmm. restaurants and stuff and and they're around me all the time. And it's interesting because in their mind, they think they're doing all these things because they, they're, they're perceiving it through social media or YouTube or but they haven't done the work yet. you got to go do the work. You know what I mean? And so I think it's I think every I think this new generation is very um, idealistic. I think they all have great plans. I think they're extremely smart and well prepared. You better be well prepared as a young person now. There's no excuses. You have access to information everywhere. It's the the biggest thing is putting in the work. You know what I mean? Is is going out there and doing it. And I think that hopefully will happen. And it happens with relationships, with business, you know, with life experiences. You just got to go out there and do it. You know. And I think hopefully, you know, I think this new generation is because there's so much competition. Like back in the day, like when I started, if I got in Time Out Magazine or New York Magazine, I was already a baller before the Internet. You know what I mean? Yeah. But now people are self-made experts and little brands and little iconic people in society because of social media. So, you know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. it's you know, it, it, like the competition of being recognize and, and, and separate from the pack is a lot harder now because everyone has the potential of being somebody because they're on these little damn things all the time isn't, you know what i mean isn't that the new work though figuring yeah. out how to be like a how to do it on the social platforms figuring yeah. out how to connect in that way and you know i feel like that's part of the new world though i'll give you an example okay so when i started cooking you know, 25 years ago, you would hire a traditional publicist, right? A PR person, right? Mm-hmm. And then they would get you a placement in New York Times, they get you a placement in the LA Times and all that. And that was like what you wanted, you know? Um, and that was huge. Get your review out there, you know, that was it. And now that style of traditional PR is gone. Now, in my, like my team, hmm. we all invest in social media now. I have two two kids that are that are my team that just do that 100%. Hmm. So, yes, we have a, a traditional PR person too that does some other things for me, but it's that's where we're at now. And 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 now you know like for people like you and I who are, you know, we, we have a narrative, we have a point of view that people want to see, you know, it, it's not enough just to do random posts. We have to look at our posts on Instagram as a business opportunity and it's hard for people that are fans of ours to be like oh man you know i feel like you know you're just posting you know your marketing partners or doing this that and the other so that's that balance that we have to figure out is how to like do personal stuff let people into our world but also use it as a business tool i agree i totally agree i think that social media is uh you have to st- you have to stick to the stick to the original reason why people pay attention to it, which is that they get a little insight into your life Mm -hmm. and they see you in a different way than what normally you see on TV. Mm -hmm. And so they get to know you better. So like my argument with the social was, has always been that, you know, I, I, you know, I I really, cause I, I mean, it's sharing is, something that's not super hard for me, but it's also like, how much do you really want to share? And, Mm -hmm. um, but it's gotta be, and then there's also people who, you know, whether it be Somnium or my new label, Danica Rose, or whether Mm. it be selling my book or whether it be, you know, promoting my podcast or whatever Mm. it may be, people get a little worn out. They want you to promote it. Like all the people that are involved want to want you to promote it, but I'm like, you gotta go like, I don't know. I think the, I think it's like, 80, 90% like you, and then the rest of it, the small percentage has got to be the A little base. Of things. Yeah, yeah, the motion, yeah, yeah. I, I get it, you know. And for you, you're, I mean, 
you know, just because you're, you know, I, I, again, I'm going to come back to what my mom and, and you have in common. It's like you, you guys went into a male dominated field mm-hmm. and you guys kicked ass <laughs> and you had to be staunch with the way you handle your business, staunch with how much you let people in. So for someone like you, it's a lot different from me in the sense because I've done TV for so long and I think people kind of know me a little bit. But you, you've kind of, you've been under the helmet, you know, literally. Mm. And, you know, for some, a big part of your life. And then now you're out and people are very intrigued on what you have to say. You know what I mean? Because you just had to be like, boom, boom, focused. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So I just think, we, you know, we, we owe a service to people that follow us. And I think that's why you can't be lazy with social media and things like that. Because mm-hmm. you know, we created a platform and we have mm-hmm. to deliver. Why did you, know? you why did you write a memoir? You know what? At at 45 years old, I didn't think I thought I was too young to do it to be honest. I thought you did that when you were older, you know. But I lived a lot of life very quickly cuz of, of my mom and how I just how everything rolled out for me and I wanted to make sure that the new generation was prepared uh, and understand that you can have faults, you can have problems with addiction, you can have problems with depression, you can lose one of your parents, you can do all these things, and it's okay, and you don't have to be ashamed of it. Mm. You know, I went on the Dr. Oz's show, you know, because Daphne now is a new judge on MasterChef Junior, and she's mm-hmm. amazing. And I went on her show, and I just, I let it all out. I didn't care. I, you know what? I'm, I'm not ashamed. And I wanted that, this, the memoir to be more so than anything, an inspirational tale, but also a cautionary one. Mm. Don't make the mistakes I made. And granted, it was a different time, but I wanted it to be this, this sort of something tangible that, that people can sort of uh, get inspiration from, you know, and, 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 and see if they see some similarities in the way they're brought up or who they are. And so that was why I wanted to do it, you know, and it was very cathartic. It was super therapeutic to like purge, you know what I'm saying? And just, sit there and let it all out. It was like a big old therapy session. It was awesome. What was the hardest thing to share? I think, you know, aspects of my, the family dynamics. I think, you know, everybody, you know, you want to, you know, you want your dad to be your hero and you want to be spotless and not have any, um, any, your shortcomings and any, any dark sides of them. And that just wasn't me. So that was a big, you know, that wasn't my dad. My dad had a lot of things he had to deal with, you know. So that was, uh, that was very difficult for me to share because everyone, you know, I'm, I have a nine-year-old son. I want my son to look at me as, as Superman, you know. And uh, I kind of understood some of, the, some of the things he did that was hard to mention. And so that was hard. And then I guess the other part of just like the depression, you know, and, mm-hmm. you know, being having way too res- too much responsibility too young mm-hmm. i took on too much uh too young and i just had to kind of deal with it mm-hmm. so then i kind of retreated you know personally and you know i needed more mentoring i needed more life experiences but i just took it on and de- dealt with it and then i think i suffered a little bit just from a happiness standpoint because mm. i was so involved in my craft i was just that's all i did and i, I didn't know how to have any balance so what's the what 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 was your recommendation then to slow that down to get to yeah. how how would you how would you redo it and re you know repackage mm-hmm. that for the for someone that was listening that you know is on this super fast path maybe and mm-hmm. you know you just it's a slippery slope and well it happens with athletes all the time you know you know you become a prodigy right and you got people telling you what to do all the time and, you know, how to live your life, what to eat, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And I mean, for me, I just think you got to, you got to schedule personal time for yourself. Like you would schedule business. Right. So that's what I've done. Like I schedule my family time, mm. I schedule time for me, like when I want to work out or I want to go away and, you know, on a retreat with no one around. So you just, I, that would be a, one recommendation. And another recommendation is just, you know, figure out, you know, just have all your goals written down. You know, for me, I didn't have, like, I didn't have goals. Like I knew I wanted to own my own restaurant. That was my dream. But at the end of the day, you just got to, you know, put everything down. Like I have my board back here where I write things down and that's helpful. Cause when I get up and have coffee in the morning, I know what we need to attack. What's on it. Well, I mean, What's right now I have board? all, I what have are you all willing these, to share? 
I have no, I have all these proteins and stuff like this, all these different flavor combinations that I have here. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll show you. Let's see if you can see. I just don't want to break it. Uh huh. Okay. So I, have like, I have like ground beef, pasta, black beans, fennel, so you know, all the different sauces. So it just reminds me of all the different flavor combinations. So, like, <laughs> that's something I did the other day. And, you know, just trying to always uh, have a goal and be productive. Like, I, well, you know what I taught my son? I said, we're gonna, we, how, how we're going to attack every day is we're going to wake up, we're going to do something physical, right? So we go to the gym or we work out, we go to the park, we have to do something physical, feed our body. Then we're going to feed our mind. So we're going to read or we're going to go to a museum or we're going to try to feed our mind and get right. Then we'll feed our bodies by eating something. And then you can have free time and do what you want. Wow. Where did you learn? Like, where did that? I just came up with it. I just came up with it. But was this a, is this a quarantine rule? or is Yeah, this... it, well, it's a quarantine rule kind of. But huh. yeah, I was just like, because I'm just a person that has to be working all the time. So I've had to become creative to how to kind of take this energy and take it, put it somewhere, you know? Hmm. Mm -hmm. How does your, so this is with your son, right? Yeah, my nine-year-old. So what does, uh, and you said he's nine. So this is such good lessons for someone that's nine years old to just understand that, you know, oh, wow, I should do something for my mind. Okay, wow. How does he, yeah. was, he re was he receptive to it or? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, Young enough yeah. that he goes with the flow? <laughs> totally, I mean, but, you know, he, he much likes the, the Nerf gun war we'll have, you know, or he <laughs> likes, you know, he likes the other stuff, but, you know, but we have to sit him down and he has to read for 45 minutes, you know, and. So, you know, he knows what time it is. We'll have a, you know, not in this home, but my L.A. house. Um, you know, I have like a whole little library area and, and I just leave the book there. And he goes, I know, daddy. I know. I got to read. I'm like, yeah, bro. Sorry. So that was the good things, you know. Yeah, that's amazing. What, what, um, what, are, your, some, what are some of your things? What do you, you know, do to I take like care to do, of yourself other than making oh, sure you plan some, you know, downtime and, and, yeah. and well, what else do you do? I like to be out in the open in, in the woods. You know what I mean? I like to be in nature, you know, so with, whether it's fishing or hiking and doing all that cool stuff. I like, I love that. I love being outside. Um, yeah. And then, you know, I do the, the typical workout stuff and all that. I played basketball when I was young. So I'll go out there and shoot some hoops. You know, I, I did this, the NBA celebrity all-star game a couple years back here in New Orleans, and it was hilarious. You know, like playing basketball in the Superdome, you know what I mean, in front of all these people, and, you know, it, it was a trip. So, yeah, so basketball, big sports guy, obviously. I love racing. I love that. And, you know, just kicking back. I love museums. I go to museums all the time. Love art. Oh. Really? Yeah. Me too. Yeah. I'm recently single. So like for me to go me to a too. museum. <laughs> awesome. Okay. I love it. I love it. Um, but, you know, for me, it's, you know, I can't think of a better date, you know, than take somebody to a, to a museum, you know, hmm. and have a little what late kind of lunch. Do you like? What kind of art do you like? I like all of it, you know. Um, I'm like super nerdy when it comes to... Um, like I'm fascinated with Vikings. I be, I watch all those Viking shows. God, I yeah. love that. I kind of feel like I used to be a Viking. Cause did you know that yeah. women women fought were, with the men? Yes, yeah. women fought with the men. That's why I love it. I like. I really feel like at some point in time I was at the front of one of those Viking ships coming across the ocean. Like you know, you know what you'd be called a shield maiden. A shield what? maiden is, is is the ladies that fought right alongside their men. How badass is that? So and, cool. and women back in Nordic times can divorce dudes, which was like in, in, in the ninth century, that was like unheard of. You could divorce huh. a dude, huh. you know, you, you can have a lover on the side. Like it was cool, man. Like, so my mom's a hundred percent Norwegian. So oh, there you like, go. Half, so there's a real chance that maybe there's some Viking blood in me. I love it. Well, that's the reason that you're such a badass. You and know? then the other thing that I feel is like a, the more like, Mayan Aztec culture, like yep, you know, there's thing. some, there's a chance that I also was, uh, you know, 
running, <laughs> running the show as a Mayan queen or something like that. I mean, why do we make ourselves out to be these superheroes? I don't know. <laughs> nobody ever said, nobody ever said, man, you know, I saw myself as, uh, saw myself as a plumber and there's nothing wrong with yeah. them, right? Or, you know, nobody said like, ah, I saw myself working at a fast food joint, you know, and like, no, nobody ever saw themselves. They only see themselves as like Viking Queens and, you know, like yeah. somebody that ran the world. Right. <laughs> yeah. And that's so hard. You know, and I always tell people, cause I have a lot of friends that are from Mexico and from abroad and they always tell me like, we'll have wine and we'll like, we'll have like deep talks. And they say, you know, you Americans, you define yourselves by your jobs. You know, we live to work. They work to live. You know what I'm saying? In other mm -hmm. countries, we're so defined with our work and it's, I'm this and I'm that. People just want to be happy. Work is just a means to your happiness. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's why they take holiday for a month and a half in Europe and all those kind of things. Because it's important to have family time and, or, and alone time or whatever. So I think that's important. But for me, people like you and I, we're screwed because we just, I think we want to just always approve upon and find that next goal and get it done. Because we've built something and you want to continue to build it, you know? I mean, it's not going to be happy with how many layers you have. It has to get bigger, you know? There is some, because there is some joy in that. Right. Yeah, I don't think absolutely. that being determined and accomplishing thing means that you're disconnected from yourself in a way that, um, you know, you're not happy at all. There is some joy in accomplishing. There is some joy in doing something that you love. But I think that's the trick, right? That's the yeah. trick is finding something that you love to do instead of, you know, um, just something that makes you a bunch of money is actually Thanks. really loving to do it. So, you know, I think you, I mean, to me, like, there's no question that you found it. Would you, do you question nope. whether or not you found that? I, I, I can't even imagine myself doing anything else. And I know it's a cliche, but I don't feel like I really work. I just love what I do. You know what I mean? And that's allowed me to pay more attention to other things that are important, like relationships, like family, you know, giving back. You know, that's why I have my scholarship where I put Latino kids into culinary school. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and currently I have like nine kids enrolled. They go to culinary school in New York City, and it's been one of the most grateful uh, things that I've done in the last last few years is, is planting seeds for that next generation. You know, the lifestyle that I've afforded now and the things I have is because I'm cooking, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Which is a humble job. Mm -hmm. You have to remember in just 20 years ago, chefs were forgotten people. We were in the back. Now chefs are, are brands. Now chefs are this, that, and the other, you know, and you can thank Emerald, our buddy, you can thank yep. Gordon for that, Ramsey. You can, you know, for they've literally changed the pay you, scale. Me, you. thank you, thank, thank yes. you. Yes, we've we've literally changed the pay scale for chefs. We've given more. We've given. We've changed the marketplace. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. As far as how we should be compensated, how we should be recognized and treated, mm -hmm. all those things are now different now. Yeah, and this is the other thing. Danica was more like in my book, I was there at the inception of the celebrity chef. I know that, sh that shit before I was there when it was happening, where we what were getting paid that? this. What year well, was I that? Well, I mean, it's, it's like right when Food Network, when Food Network early 90s, like 25 years mid ago. Yeah, oh. mid 90s, mid 90s. 25, yeah. 30 years is how about how old is that about how old? The well, maybe 20 years since it's been really popping where chefs have been getting you know, like they're just due, you know what I mean? And so it's, it's, it's crazy to see what's happened, you know, like I'm no, I'm no longer just a guy that cooks, you know, I'm like, like a cultural person that changes opinions and, and people look up to me and I mentor people and that there's so much going on now, you know, as, as opposed, it's just simple cooking. When you say that and say like mentoring and inspiring, um, what was your, relationship with that at first you know i mean because i lost my daddy when i was young and I, I needed to have um 
older people to help guide me, you know? So I, I really needed mentoring when I was very young, like 16, 17, I was in a very volatile time. And I, you know, I was resistant at first, but then I, now I'm, now I'm so thankful of it. Um, and the biggest part about mentoring is making time, you know, like my kids, we try to set up a weekly call. I call them my kids, but there's my the huh. scholarship, the, the scholarship recipients, you know, that are in my program. I try to make sure that I speak to them once a week and just, you know, what are you guys doing? Like, talk to me about your cooking. Do you miss your family? You know, whatever. And that's mentoring. That's giving them a little hug and being like, hey, I got your back. I'm thinking about you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's so important in the restaurant business is mentoring and just, you know, finding somebody that can take you one stop and then you find another mentor and then they, they can do that. Cause you know, being a, part of being a successful chef is developing your own style, Danica. It's not about regurgitating the lessons from your mentor because then you just become a clone. Right. So the real key in being, and this happens in any facet of art, in my opinion, you take all of those lessons that you've learned from the people that have influenced you. And then through that process, you develop your own voice. You know what I'm saying? Your own identity through those mentors that you've had. And that way you separate yourself from them, but still pay homage to them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. How'd you do that? Well, it was through travel and through being a rebel. I'm a, I'm a tough son of a bitch. You know, like, I don't like people telling me what to do. Since I was young, I was like, my mom used to say, I'm like a, there's a great word that you should learn. It's called uh, amansado, and it means to season. Uh, so like my mom grew up in a cattle ranch. So you would have a bronco or a horse that no one can ride that, that horse because it was such a pain in the ass, but it was strong. You would have to amansar the horse. You'd have to break it in. Mm, mm. So I'm, I needed to be broken in. You know mm. what I'm saying? Because mm. I was like, I had all the talent. Yeah, I was wild and I, and, and I had all, you know, I had all the strength and all the ability, but I just didn't know how to listen, you know? So once you get broken in and you get right, you know what I mean? It's something really beautiful. So I just needed to start to listen. You do, you know, remember, do you remember when that happened? Like, was there a story of like, you were like, oh yeah, I get it now. Yeah, um, well, the biggest one, so I worked at Cape Paul, Chef Paul Perdon, arguably one of the most recognizable chefs in the country. We used to do book signings, uh, like at a fancy food show or whatever. There'd be 500 people waiting to see him, you know, 400 pounds in a buggy, women throwing themselves at him, throwing themselves at them. Like, here's my number, chef, call me later. Hmm. I'm like, holy shit, like, you know, <laughs> crazy stuff, you know? So... I worked there and I did a job where I had to like work six in the morning to 6 p.m. And I had to make big things of chicken stock, like 50 gallons of chicken stock and do all this. And you would have to taste anything you made. You had to get it to the chefs and they would approve it. They would say, oh, that's good or it needs this and that. So I met this girl the day before on my day off on Canal Street here in New Orleans. And this is pre-cell phone. So I'm like, hey, baby, I get done at six tomorrow. Meet me here at 630 and we'll go on a date, right? So I'm like hauling ass at work that day because I needed to go meet her. And at four o'clock, I brought this jalapeno vinegar. It's three ingredients, vinegar, sugar, and jalapenos. I messed it up, of course, because I was rushing. The chef tasted. He tasted and he goes, oh, man, that's not right, boy. Do it again. I'm like, sure. Clean up, bring him back the same shit, the same vinegar. In front of all my colleagues, and I'm 16, by the way, so right, I'm, like right. a, I'm like a knucklehead, you know? Or I might have been 18, because I came back when I was 18. Regardless, I was still a knucklehead. So I bring it back, and he sees it, and he goes, you must think I'm an idiot, huh? It was so, so embarrassing. Everyone was walking away from me. They're like, you messed up, I don't <laughs> And then without missing a beat, he goes, what's your name? He goes, what's your name? I go, oh. Chef, her name's Christina. Uh, she's really hot. And he's like, well, say goodbye to Christina because you're working tonight. So I never had a chance to go. You know what I mean? So it was a great lesson. And that was like the last shortcut I ever took. You know, because it's going to come out at the end. You know what I mean? There's no use fighting it. 
Are there any other things that you feel like you've had to learn the hard way that have really yeah. changed your life? Like the, the most influential things in your life to get you to where you are now? Um, well, you know, I think being honest with my, my marriage you know, that didn't work out, I think was a big part of like who I am now. Just, you know, when you, when you, when you, that's like when you, I, you prioritize work and then, you know, you're not, you're not present and you're not there. And, you know, that was something that I took for granted. So now I'm very much more present now, mm. you know, I'm Aquarius. So I'm very aloof. I'm oh, I looked that up. I saw your birthdays in February. I was like, oh, no wonder why you have all the tattoos. No wonder why <laughs> yeah. you're a chef because you're super creative. You're yeah. eclectic. You're yeah. off. You're just, you're just like Aquarius people are just, you know, they march to the beat of their own drum. Exactly. And one of the biggest things about being an Aquarius is that you're aloof. So you always, like in my mind, I always think I'm people, I know what people are thinking of me. But I've become better. Shh, cállate. Sorry. It's okay. um, I'm just glad yeah. my dogs haven't barked yet. One yeah. of them's sleeping on the other side of this t desk, and then the other one is sleeping somewhere where it's cold. So, <laughs> do you guys have older dogs or younger? They're five and six. So, do you live with your family? Who no, do you live I live with? by myself. Oh wow! Remember okay. we talked about this? Newly single. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I've been single in 16 years. And where do you live in uh, California? No, I'm in Scottsdale. And Scott still. Mm -hmm. oh, so do you know? Do you know? Um, Scott. You know Scott. Yeah. Scott, so yeah, Scott Cohen. I I saw. I ran into him at the grocery store a while back. They call him Scotty the Hottie, by the way. Scotty the Hottie. Okay, but he's very much marriage, uh, married, <laughs> married, <Yeah. laughs> very much married. <laughs> I love it, but uh, yeah, that's funny. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Life's um, always sending us little lessons, you know? I mean, I think that, you know, you talk about like, you know, marriage and prioritizing work, but that's it. That's so many people's story. That's not just, yeah. and I think that, yes, do I think it's probably harder for someone who's, you know, in a partnership with someone who is in the world of, you know, in the restaurant business and working weird hours and long hours and the harder you work, the more you make kind of thing. I mean, but that's, uh, there's a lot of business. I mean, that's, that's a lot of people's story. Yeah. I agree. I agree. And it's good to say it, you know, it's, there's something really special about just being like, this is where I'm at in life. The coolest part about getting older is knowing what you want. You know what I mean? And being like, all right, I, you know, I'm looking for this, or this is what, you know, makes me happy. And, but still being open at the same time. So you kind of have to be like, play that game, you know? What are those things that you've come to realize m more recently that uh, make you happy? Mm. I think meeting new people. Mm. I think um, having people, like having exchanges with someone that were something uh, where they're vulnerable and you have the, the honor of getting to know that and the privilege of getting to know someone's mm. heart. I think that's mm. something so special. Mm. You know, my mom told me a great piece of advice. She goes, never mess with a woman's heart. You'll be in trouble, boy. You know, just be honest. If you treat people with honesty and respect, you'll never go back. Just tell them, you know, this is who I am or this is what I'm about. Like, mm. if you don't, if it's not for you, then whatever, you know, move on. But just be honest and be respectful, you and know. Has that, has that been easy and natural for you all along or is that more something yeah. that do you think that takes age to do that? Yeah. Or is that just, yeah. did it just take the parent, the right parent to tell you to do that? Yeah. It takes age and experience, you know, like, you know, yeah, I've been married once. Um, yeah, I've been in, in some relationships, but I've had a lot of great lovers, too, in between, you know. Wait, hang on. Women, What's the difference between uh, relationships and lovers? Is that is that not? Well, a no, lover is what the kids call hooking up now, but people in the okay, States, okay, okay. And, and you're, in Europe, uh, you call it a lover, you know what I mean? But I don't think there's nothing wrong with saying that, you know okay. what I mean? I'm not Friends ashamed. Of benefits, like. Yeah, but they but they would they would view the ladies would view me the same way, you know. But I'm talking about throughout my life. Mm. Like I've been with oof, like five women that are just absolute keepers in my time that were that should have been, you know, and they're they're married now and they're doing their thing, but I at the time I didn't realize it. You know what I'm saying? Was were just they just like, lovers? 
Yeah, we were just, you know, we were kicking it, having a good time, but I just didn't, you know what I mean? And it was just like, so, you know, so. That, but I'm that such makes a relationship me. person. I'm like, wow, I've never even crossed my mind, like, to, to, to yeah. be a lover, to, like, yeah. have someone that's not, it's not serious. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, everyone's different. It, it, no, no, no. Yeah. It might be it's, a great sorry. thing. Yeah. It just, it's, I mean, for me, it's just because, the, <laughs> I mean, I travel 200 days a year, you know what I'm saying? It, you know, back before all this went down, like, so it's not like I'm anywhere at one time for a long time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you find yourself in these places, you know what I mean? So, and you're an Aquarius. An Aquarius as well. So, but yeah, but now, you know, as I'm getting older, you know, I, <laughs> I don't know, you know, it's just... What else makes you happy? What do you do for fun? <laughs> what do you do for fun? Well, you know, we, I like to ride horses. I'm into that. Huh. I think that's really cool because my family grew up in a cattle ranch. I dig that. Um, what else? Like, you know, I like to tour vineyards. You know, I think I love doing that. Museums, I said that earlier. You know, I work all the time. So it's like, for me, like when somebody asks me what my hobby is or what I like to do for fun, it's shit you know I, I don't really think about it you know what i mean i just find myself in like with friends mostly swimming going to the ocean i love being in the water you know fun stuff like that mm -hmm. you know what about you <laughs> um you know the older i get the more um and especially being done with racing and mm -hmm. you know kind of really realizing that something that i loved about it was <clears throat> putting myself in uncomfortable situations and overcoming mm. it and facing it. So now as I'm away from racing, I find myself doing things like jumping off of a cliff or, mm -hmm. you know, learning how to, learning how to wake surf or something like that. Or, you know, back when I, when I hosted the ESPYs, like saying yes mm. to things that are kind of scary or different, um, mm. more so, so yeah, kind of pushing myself, challenging myself. But you're an adrenaline junkie. I'm not, that's not it. No, it's not about the adrenaline. In fact, the adrenaline scares the shit out of me. Mm. It's um, more about it, new things. Yeah. It's about knowing that if I have to push the, if I have to push my comfort zone to a place that it's not been before or a place that's just not comfortable, that I know I can do it. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Like yeah. I'm afraid of heights. I hate heights so too, I by went, the way. So I went bungee jumping. I am mm. no less afraid of heights. I'm still afraid of heights, but I like to know that if I need to jump, I can still jump. Yeah, I hear you. Man, we went, we shot the show I had in, in, in Mexico. We, I went on an air balloon with- uh, A hot air my, balloon? Yeah, hot, I mean, yeah, hot air balloon with the chef, mm -hmm. uh, my co-host. And we fulfilled someone's dream because they have never want, they never can afford to go on to a hot air balloon. I was scared shitless. Yeah. But there was one point when you break the cloud line and you see all the other hot air balloons going around you. And it was something so special, you know, and that helped me calm a little bit of that fear. You know what I mean? So, yeah, there's things like that that need to happen in, in time. It's easy just to be insulated, you know? Yeah. Is that, so is that something that, I mean, is that, I feel like a lot of people are more brave than I am. I don't know. People think that I'm brave because I drove a race car, but you know, I think there's a lot of people that just are much more brave and like, they just do, do they, they say yes and do random stuff all the time, yeah. but maybe not. Yeah. That's a good point. Comfort zone. Do you, yeah. do, do you find that you do, you, do you find that you stay in your comfort zone? most of the time or do you like do you get out of do you do you push yourself yeah, you, you, ha you, you have to you have to man like i'm a big homebody before covid shit like i like watching all those shows and my my little forensic files and all that and then you know there'd be times it'd be a friday night you know by myself i should be out you know what i'm saying it just yeah. you know, interacting with people you know or but i just want to kick back on the couch or whatever so like things like that and you know, not, not finding excuses to go visit a friend, you know, in another city and be like, hey, man, let me just catch up. You know, I miss you, you know. Mm -hmm. So those are things that I've, I've gotten better about, just, mm -hmm. you know, being more spontaneous and random and just mm -hmm. jumping on a plane and getting somewhere and, you know, hey, man, what's up? I missed you, you know. Mm -hmm. Let's go eat. Let's go have a good time. What are you most looking forward to doing when 
all of the sort of restrictions and quarantine stuff is yeah. over with. Music festivals. I <gasps> love music festivals. Because I cook at a lot of them. Paddle Rock. Um, yeah. All, all, yeah. The big, all the big ones. That, uh, Austin. Austin the city Limit, Austin. Yeah, the yeah. City Limits. All the Voodoo Fest here in New Orleans. So I miss music. I miss live music. I miss being out just going from one little field to the other and having another, you know, stage there where someone's playing music and then running over here. That's the thing I miss the most. And going to live sporting events. You know, that's the other one I miss a lot. Yeah. And yeah. Of course, and of course, restaurants that are packed. You know what Have I mean? Have you gotten a- even sick of cooking at all? Like, I love cooking too. I think, I mean, like I was saying before to my producer, I feel like I know a lot of chefs because I've done a lot of, you know, yeah. cooking shows and things like that. And I just truly love cooking. Um, but even I get, you know, I mean, I get sick of cooking. No, I don't ever get sick of cooking. It's like, <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, like don't, you know, a lot of, I have a lot of friends that are musicians and they always ask me, are you sick of playing that song? And they go, if I get sick of playing that song, then I'm going to start playing songs, you know? So, like, it's just something that you always love. You know, I never get tired of it. I, I love it. So. Mm. Well, that's when you know that you're really doing what you love. Yeah. I got I to gotta go, baby. I have something yeah. to do. I'm sorry. Great. No, it's good. You, no, I can sit here and talk to you all night. No, I, I think really that's can. a perfect way. I think that's a perfect way to end. You're living. You, you probably got to go cook. Yeah. I do, <laughs> sadly. But I just wanted to say thank you so much. Yeah. You're absolutely you. special. You're like a big beam of light. Aww. I really have to say Probably that you're I wonderful. Have all these lights shining on me. But no, you know. no. You're <laughs> the you're the example and the epitome of a strong woman that is continuing to redefine themselves and make people happy. You should mm-hmm. feel really great about yourself and what you mm-hmm. do every day, okay? Thank you. You're, you're stunning. Are- a wonderful so, soul, and I hope I see you again soon if I have to come to New Orleans and bring my wine, and you bring your tequila. Andale. We got it all day long. All right. Thank you. Bye, sweetie. Thanks, everybody, for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.